Well, hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe video. Uh, we have a handful of things to talk about actually this week. Uh, really, um, I'm, I'm kind of carving up the things happening right now in the market and the sort of major themes that I want investors thinking about in the months ahead around three different silos. And it's kind of unfolded this way organically. It's made for three major category conversations, if you will. So I'll uh, kind of present some of that uh, right now, and, and hopefully it will uh, help us decipher things into at least the next couple of months. Um, as I sit here and talk, and we're recording in the middle of the day on Thursday, uh, the market's up a little bit on the week. Um, last week it had come down a little, uh, but you know, not not really major movements one way or the other. It's been in a pretty tight range, even this week. When I say it's up, I think it's less than 200 points on the week net net at this time. Um, listen, when I say three different things, I want to present to you kind of three categories, and I'm going to spend most of my time today talking about one of them. Now, we've already spent a lot of time talking about the issue of earnings recession, and that's presupposing the negative side of it, earnings growth. An earnings recession is if that growth goes negative for two quarters in a row. Do we have two quarters in a row where earnings year over year are less than they were the year before? I am not forecasting that, although I do think it's a possibility but uh, that is sort of a conversation and a theme that as we go into the first quarter earnings results season, so in the middle of April when companies start reporting their first quarter earnings and we are kind of evaluating what took place the year prior, that's going to be um, a conversation and a theme that could carry on through the whole rest of the year. Because especially if my little theory plays out, which is that maybe we do go slightly negative in earnings growth for Q1, but then it proves short-lived, a one and done, and in fact we resume earnings growth, bit, you know, growth year over year on into the second quarter, third quarter, et cetera, and in and end the year on a full four-quarter basis with positive earnings growth in 2019, which would be pretty remarkable. A with all of the negativity that's been embedded in the earnings uh, forecast, but B based on how robust the earnings growth had been the year prior to grow on top of such a high denominator would be quite impressive. So there's the earnings growth story. And then number two is one we've been talking about for you know a year and with a lot of spe specificity over the last four or five months, the China trade talks, which were near a conclusion on but not at a conclusion. And again, because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it right now, the quick summary is that we believe most of the good news that we hope is coming is priced in. If the good news doesn't come in, then look out below. And then there is the possibility that the good news is priced in does not include as good as it could get. And what I mean by that is the Chinese are asking for some of the legacy tariffs to be lifted in exchange for them just this week announcing they wanted to let U.S. companies into their data centers, which they have previously resisted, and uh, ongoing provisions and protections on these technology um, exposures. And so if the enforcement provisions are there that make the U.S. authorities happy, do they allow some of the legacy tariffs to come off, which would be very pro-growth on the supply side? Uh, so let's put it this way. I kind of hate doing this, but it's reasonably interesting. 70% chance the China deal is priced in. 10% it's not because things go bad. 20% it's not because things get better. That's my rough estimate of where that plays out. So we'll continue to monitor that. Earnings growth, China trade, and then our third story, and this is what I'm going to spend next five or so minutes talking to you about, the yield curve. Uh, last week, and of course it happened after I recorded for the week, and so that's the way it goes. The yield curve did officially invert last week. And what I mean by that, and even as I sit here talking right now, you can borrow money for the United States government uh, for 10 years, and you'll pay them less interest than you would, excuse me, you would loan money to the United States government. I'm saying it backwards. The United States government borrow money from you and pay less money for 10 years than they would for one month let alone three months, six months, a year, three, five. So the longer end of the curve right now is a lower interest rate, longer maturities than the shorter end. And that's what we call yield curve inversion. It's backwards. You would say intuitively it doesn't make a lot of sense. And the reason why is because it doesn't. And the re well, how does something happen that doesn't make sense? Because something's broken. 
some policy error or some economic anomaly is distorting the way capital markets are supposed to function. So one of the things I unpack a lot this week at DividendCafe.com and have other charts and things to support it, and I'm going to kind of do my best to give you the rundown right now, is I make the, the case that it is largely driven, the U.S. 10-year bond yields coming so low is largely driven not by fear of U.S. growth longer term being underwhelming, but European and global growth long term being underwhelming. We've seen in the last couple of weeks German bond yields collapse. We've seen German manufacturing collapse. And this is the strong country in the European Union. This is like the good one. Those data points collapsing and, and perfectly in tandem with that, it's brought down U.S. Treasury yields because you have a lot of international economic actors flooding into U.S. Treasuries saying, hey, here's where we can get long duration. And now Germany is going to negative yields. We can get 2.5% in the U.S. So there are people that would not buy United States Treasuries at three and a quarter at Thanksgiving that now are buying it at two and a half. And, and so that has brought down longer term yields, even as the Fed from their monetary tightening last year, they're on hold right now, but they did enough hiking last year that it brought the short term rates up, which inverted the yield curve. Uh, has the yield curve every time it's inverted led to a recession? Yes. Um, meaning as recession followed. This is something I want to repeat and I can't repeat enough. The yield curve is not causative of a recession. The yield curve is not causative of anything. It is, it is reflective. It is showing things that are going on, not creating things that are going on. So what you have right now is a higher borrowing cost short term and less confidence in economic growth long term that has caused this to flip upside down. I have a very, not strong feeling, I have a lukewarm feeling that I might have to eat my words about the fact that, of course, the Fed would not dare cut rates this year. I still maintain fervently that they should not do so. They did not even get to the point of the neutral rate that they were trying to get to to normalize monetary policy. This is in the middle of a period where we have a labor shortage of workers, where we have the best wage growth we've had in decades, where we had economic growth over 3% net of inflation last year. All economic metrics are strong in the U.S., and yet they had to stop raising rates because of the damage it was doing into credit markets. Well, I, I, my thought a month or so ago would have been, of course, they wouldn't cut rates in the middle of being stuck where they are right now. However, the Fed futures market is now pricing in a 70% chance they will cut rates by the end of the year. I believe it was as of yesterday was about a 40% chance of one rate cut and a 30% chance of two rate cuts this year. And, and I don't think that's a positive thing, even though I suspect markets could very well react very positively to it. But why would the Fed do that to, to readjust the yield curve, to bring short-term borrowing costs below longer-term borrowing costs, which, which creates a, a lot of economic malfunction? So I don't know that they will cut. I can only tell you what the bond futures market is predicting. The bond futures market is basically never wrong when it's 95%, 99%. Um, and of course, even then it could be, right? Never say never in our business. But 40, 30 and totaling up 70, it's not enough for me to say like, okay, this is going to happen. But look, I mean, 70%, it was 0% a couple months ago. That's where we are. All right, so I'm using a lot of terms here, yield curve, normalization. You want to know what's going on. I think that's the best way for me to explain it. There remains a lack of confidence in long-term sustainable economic growth. Uh, and my thesis has been that the U.S. is taking steps towards getting there with corporate tax reform, repatriation, expensing of capital expenditures, renewed business confidence, that that would represent uh, the acceleration for economic growth that could lead to a continuance of our economic recovery. Now the yield curve is saying, okay, wait a second, though. What about Europe? What about Japan? What about China? What about emerging markets? So the question is, Will the U.S. take its lead from the world or will the world take its lead from the U.S.? And I don't think anyone 
can answer that. I don't think anyone should answer it, but that represents the risk that's embedded in markets right now. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, of course you know what we're gonna do about it. We're gonna keep buying high quality companies, a lot of which have a multinational presence, some of which are almost entirely domestic. We're gonna keep buying high quality companies in the emerging markets that are representative of a good value. We're gonna accept the market volatility that comes with that process. And we're gonna focus on free cash flow that uh, on a bottom up basis is a, a superior indicator to us than macroeconomic in, uh, data. The macroeconomic data has been mixed for a long time and it's mixed now. U.S. it's positive, globally it's tepid, mix it together, there's some uncertainty. Um, I'm talking pretty fast, but that's because I've had a lot to say and these are you know, pretty uh, uh, meaty conversations to take on. So uh, your friend asks you, what are the things that matter right now in the economy? What are the things your, your investment guy is talking about? It's, it's earnings growth. It is China trade and it is the yield curve. And those are things we're going to continue to watch and, and form our asset allocation decisions around that. Right now, we most certainly are very happy with what we've done uh, from an asset allocation standpoint. Uh, first quarter ends here in about 24 hours. By the time you're watching this, it probably will have ended. And uh, we'll have all kinds of uh, quarterly recap for you next week. Uh, for those interested, we have a full Advice and Insights podcast this week of the Mueller investigation, laying out all the market implications of where we are in that whole political scene and the various con controversies and, and, and drama out of Washington, D.C. So a market special Advice and Insights around the Mueller collusion narrative. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for watching the Dividend Cafe video. As always, reach out to us with any questions and enjoy your college basketball weekend.